uh, it's really fun to be here. Uh, and you know, when we talk about whether our economic models work for our own people, uh, I think many people around the world look to Denmark. I know, I know you're probably debating whether it works for you or not, but uh, if seen from outside, it looks pretty good. <coughs> and, uh, and that's, I think, my starting point because I uh, spent a lot of time in Europe and I spent a lot of time in the United States. In the United States, you know, the debate, if you mention Europe these days, unfortunately, uh, people say, wow, uh, you know, it's a mess. What's going on? You know, can't the Europeans get their act together? Uh, it's really quite something. Uh, if you looked at our presidential campaign, Europe was mainly a slogan for contagion uh, and something to avoid. Uh, and that, there wasn't a whole lot of deep analysis there. Uh, but when I come here, I, I hear this sort of the same conversation about the Americans. You know, wow, they're a mess. You know, can't they get organized? Can't they get their act together? They're polarized. Their politics. They can't pass budgets. You know. Uh, it just seems uh, just awful. So we're having kind of the same conversation about each other. Uh, and unfortunately, because the rest of the world is marching on. And I, I think we're in one of those phases where we're each very, uh, very inward looking at and struggling with our own challenges. What the opportunity, uh, I think, President Obama and the uh, European leaders have given us now is to maybe turn that around and not to have such an inward looking uh, conversation about each other but to think about what we can do together. So I think uh, given the economic challenges we both have, though, uh, if we're going to act together in the world, we're going to have to get our acts together at home. It's real simply a precondition for that. And I think both sides understand that. And that's why uh, on our side, the President and Congress are having so many fights and so many uh, issues trying to get a hold of uh, really serious economic challenges we face. But they're all really, at, in essence, political, it seems to me. Uh, and I would argue in Europe, it's the same. We're each paying a very high economic price for what essentially are really tough political challenges or our inability to resolve some of them. In Europe, I think over the last year, you've moved a little further. I think some of the challenges of the Eurozone are maybe coming out on the other end. And uh, we'll see. It's still going to be a tough year this year. Uh, for the European Union, but really about the role of government <clears throat> in society. It's just an unending American debate, but it's really become really a polarized one. And, uh, and uh, that's sort of driving, I think, our politics. The opportunity, though, we have is to step back and how we should position our own relationship uh, for the world we're facing. I think often we have uh, sort of tended to dwell on the past. We had a great partnership and alliance during the Cold War. It was, it was of course, a threatening time, but uh, it worked out. But we have tended to frame our relationship still in that old sense. And I believe the United States, I'm not, I'm not sure the Obama administration has framed it quite this way, but I think the U.S. is really pushing Europe to rebalance and reposition the partnership for the kind of world we face today. Uh, one is in uh, security terms is simply to say uh, our alliance is still strong. Uh, we have many things we, we do. We have a Danish Secretary General of NATO. Um, but Europe, you know, the United States doesn't always have to run every issue on security, especially if the security challenges are closer to Europe. We'll be there. We can lend assets that no one else can provide, <clears throat> but we don't have to call every shot. Uh, and it's an expectation we kind of rebalance our security partnership with Europe often taking the lead in areas closer to European shores. I think the second balance, <coughs> yeah, and, the, and there are three balances that I would project. The next two, I think, are really important to this topic of the economic partnership. Because I believe the United States and Europe are, are saying to each other, let's rebalance a partnership that was heavily rooted and almost defined by a military alliance to a much broader and deeper partnership that's rooted across the board in the interconnection of our economies and our societies. And wouldn't that, in fact, be much more sustainable and healthier, in a way, than one rooted in, in really uh, a military alliance only? <clears throat> and with the end of the Cold War, isn't it time this relationship looked beyond Europe? The Cold War, when we said transatlantic relations, we meant Europe. We meant the continent of Europe. And, and maintaining stability. But uh, thank God we've made some progress there. 
But now the challenges are far from European shores. What about Iran? What about the Middle East? What about the rise of China? What about climate change? What about all these issues in which no country by itself, not even a superpower, is going to deal well on its own? Uh, the United States needs a partner. Potentially that partner is Europe. It's not there yet. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes it's fragmented. Uh, but I think the United States' concern is not a strong Europe, it's a weak Europe. Uh, and it really is looking for that stronger partner to shoulder a lot of uh, burdens that uh, we find we can't deal with on our own. So that's a very broad overview. And, but that, uh, both on that repositioning the, our relationship for global issues and repositioning within our relationship to take account of our economic partnership, I think is the heart of now what's being proposed. This is not a new idea. I was in the State Department 20 years ago. We started on this idea. So this is an old idea. <laughs> but we never got across the finish line, at least even to start the negotiations, <clears throat> because it's a tough uh, bundle of challenges. Uh, our relationship is unlike any other in the world in terms of our economic integration. Many of our challenges are not that we're drifting apart. They're that we're smashing into each other that we've never had a greater stake in Europe's success uh, economically. And Europeans have never had a greater stake in the success of the United States of America in terms of its economic growth and its uh, prosperity. Because we are so deeply tied to each other these days, and that's, those ties have accelerated since the end of the Cold War, uh, not dissipated. So how do we get a handle on that? And I think that's the framework that's now being set up. And I think uh, it's very important to understand some of the distinctions about our relationship when we think about free trade or we think about the economic ties we have with other countries. So let me try to frame what I believe uh, will need to be the framework for this negotiation. I'm not sure it will be exactly this, although I'm in touch with both sides actually quite closely, but I think they're going this way. But uh, you know, I'm a free academic, so uh, uh, maybe I'll challenge and push a little bit further than where the consensus might be. If we just take the transatlantic economic relationship itself, we have to just keep in mind it's still about half of world GDP. Uh, and you can measure it in different ways, but you know, 40 to 50 percent of the world's GDP is between the United States and, and Europe. <clears throat> so it's still important. And if you take certain things like financial uh, transactions in the in financial world is more like 75% of uh, the world's activities and deeply, deeply integrated. Um, uh, the, you know, the only real uh, reserve currencies in the world are U.S. or European. If it's not the dollar and the euro, it's also the pound and the Swiss franc. They're small, but if you put it together, it's about 90% of the world reserve currencies are still uh, in the transatlantic uh, space. So we, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that uh, we have a fundamentally important role in the world economy. Uh, it's, it's shifted from sort of a preeminent role, we used to be able to call all the shots, basically, to one that's more predominant. But it's still big. And uh, sometimes in the media, I think there's sort of for a headlong rush to talk about the rise of other uh, powers and so on. Yes, China will change the world. And yes, these other countries are rising. But they're growing from a very small base, most of them. 2% uh, growth in Europe, in the EU, which seems to be a challenge, would create a market the size of the country of Argentina each year. It wouldn't be 10% growth in Argentina. It would be Argentina. Because small growth from a big market like the EU is more important, frankly, than 10% growth from a small economy. So just focusing on growth alone uh, doesn't tell you a lot unless you talk about where you're starting from in the, in the base. So the EU single market is hugely important. It is Europe's base. It is Danish industry's base to compete in the world. <clears throat> um, so I think it, the premise is really quite important to understand uh, that we're still quite powerful. Uh, we can still make a huge difference. But we need to reposition our economies for this, the world that we're facing. The other key distinction. <clears throat> is that our economic ties with Asia, both of ours, are driven by trade. Trade is uh, the driver, trade in goods, really only just trade in goods. <clears throat> and again, in the media, 
there's an, often a tendency to equate trade with commerce as, as if it's the same thing. Uh, but it's not the same thing. Commerce is a much bigger uh, set of interactions. Uh, and so if you just dwell on trade and goods and you use that as your benchmark, well, yes, of course, then Asia is huge. Uh, and it is huge. Most of that are imports, uh, not exports from us. Um, but you have to include a few other things. You have to include trade and services. You have to include investment. And you have to include the sales of companies, uh, foreign affiliates of sales of companies, sort of American companies based here, for instance, or Danish companies based in the United States. If you put all of those pieces together, then your world view recenters again to see that the transatlantic economy is still the driver of the world economy. So this negotiation has to take account of that. It's not just another free trade agreement. It's not your daddy's free trade agreements. It's something completely different. It's a sui generis experiment, just like the EU itself. It's going to be something completely new, uh, something we've never seen before if it's going to succeed. So let me just give you a, briefly a, th a few elements of that that I think will be challenging to us, but also potentially transformative, because it will take us and the world uh, economic system into a new era. The first is trade itself. Okay, so trade's not the big driver, but it's still big across the Atlantic, $650 billion. I should say I gave the, the center here our latest survey. We do an annual survey of the transatlantic economy, uh, which we're just releasing right now on my tour, in fact. Uh, <coughs> and uh, this first volume has all the latest headline uh, facts about what's gone on in the last year between the U.S. and Europe. In the second volume, we do jobs, trade, and investment figures for all of the 50 states of the United States from Europe. And we do all of the EU uh, in terms of American source jobs, trade, and investment. So it's economic data, data, but I hope written for political leaders to understand why they should care, because uh, it's about jobs. Uh, and it really shows you in your district what, why, you should, uh, why it makes a difference. So I just leave that. I think we have a copy. It'll be up on our website. So if you talk about trade issues, <clears throat> trade across the Atlantic is not particularly tr problematic. You know, most tariffs are 3 to 5, 7%, depending on uh, what we're talking about. There are some spikes in some areas, but we basically have pretty close to free trade already across the Atlantic. So it's not the biggest issue, but because we have a big market, and we're talking about maybe a market of 800 million people from Hawaii to the Black Sea, uh, or the Baltic Sea, uh, uh, just slight changes in that big market again will be mean big, big changes in terms of growth and opportunity and jobs. So the analysis would be if you had a transatlantic zero tariff agreement, it would be worth about five times the U.S.-Korea trade deal that was just signed. And there's huge, you know, media attention to that. Uh, this would be five times that. And trade is not the most important part of this, uh, this effort. Uh, and so if we can uh, really eliminate trade uh, barriers across the Atlantic, this would be really quite something. We would be starting to move to a transatlantic single market in, in some areas. The sticker here will be agriculture, I believe, in particular. But it's on the table. They have said it's on the table. Everything's on the table. <coughs> And many would argue that now is the moment for agriculture. It's, it'll be tough, given subsidies uh, and on both sides and different ways we, uh, we help our farmers. Uh, but I think one message to agriculture is that most of the barriers across the land agriculture are not trade barriers. They're non-trade barriers. So they're, even if you wiped out all the trade barriers, they're still pretty protected, actually. Uh, and then you would then you'll have to get to the next step. But the trade piece itself isn't really... Uh, uh, you know, I think a uh, thing that will stop this agreement. I think we're going to get that, but it will be tough in many different is issues. Um, so trade is one piece. We'll have to do that. But the real driver across the Atlantic is investment. Uh, this is what distinguishes our relationship from the Pacific relationships we have. Uh, investment determines the transatlantic economic relationship. Uh, most European companies would prefer to go to the United States and set up operations there and sell their goods and services there. And most American companies would rather come here. We don't trade, actually. It's a big, we have a, you know, the United States is a big economy. We, 
But percentage-wise, we don't really, we're not a big trading company in terms of our relationship to our economy. It's a big number because we're big. But companies don't like to operate that way. They would rather go to the place <coughs> and be in the community, be in the market, and sell goods, produce, uh, you know, sell services from that market. And you see that, of course, the huge American corporate presence in, in Europe. But the European corporate presence in the United States is massive. Um, about 75% of all the investment in the United States is from Europe. It's the biggest source of onshore jobs uh, at all. And American companies are the biggest source of onshore jobs for Denmark and for uh, you know, the rest of the EU. And investment drives trade across the Atlantic. That's the other distinguishing thing. When a company goes, when, uh, when uh, Vestra, right, isn't that it? The windmill company, right? When they go uh, to Omaha, Nebraska, where, uh, where my colleague here I just saw last week was, uh, and set up uh, wind farms and uh, things in the middle of the United States, they start trading with themselves. They send parts and components from here to their subsidiary there. About two-thirds of the EU trade with the United States now is intercompany trade. It's the company trading with itself. And that trade's being driven by its investment. You have to invest and then trade with yourself. And that's what's really driving a lot of this economic relationship these days. That doesn't happen at all, really, in the, in the Pacific. That's just a trading you know, relationship. Um, and the same, American companies is not as uh, two-thirds, but it's starting to get to about 40% of American companies based here uh, it, it stimulate exports to the United States to Europe that are trade within the company. You know, it's 3M, I was just in Minnesota, so I'm thinking Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota, sending, you know, parts and components to its subsidiary in London, uh, things like that. Um, so investment is the driver. And, and again, investment across the Atlantic is not particularly problematic, except since we've had some changes. The Treaty of Lisbon has moved competence for investment to Brussels. The United States has... I don't know how many, uh, my colleague here from the embassy can tell me, bilateral investment treaties with EU member states. We have bilateral. We don't have an investment treaty with the European Union. It's, it's just a collection of individual ones. So we've entered a realm here of some legal uncertainty. Um, whether these bilateral investment treaties will take care of the job as the EU continues, as the Treaty of Lisbon uh, you know, sort of t really takes hold, uh, as, does it take care of the authorities now uh, in, uh, with central uh, with the commission in Brussels or not? I don't know that that companies don't like this sort of you know gray zone. So even if we if we could just have uh, consolidate sort of what we already have and make it a framework agreement between the U.S. and EU on investment, that would clarify something. And if we could do it at a high level, uh, basic rules uh, principles of the rules based economic order. Not only would that be important for us, but it would send a very powerful message to others around the world that we together believe in these principles and we will act together on them. <clears throat> we have not done that in the past. We've sort of issued paper about the principles, but to say we will also act on them and our own relationship will be guided by that type of basic open investment uh, paradigm would be something new. And I'll come back to that in a minute because Part of this is not what we're going to do with each other, but the message we're sending to others. But investment is really quite important. A third area that's really quite important is trade and services. We talk about trade and goods. Most people talk about trade agreements. But we are the largest services economies in the world. Most people in Denmark, most people in the United States, work in the services economy. That's where the jobs are. 80 to 90 percent, in fact, <coughs> of the economy is services. So if you're going to create jobs and do something internationally, you're going to do something in services. That's going to be the most, single most important thing any either of us could do right now internationally to create jobs would be a USEU services uh, opening. Uh, we are each other's most important services markets and uh, Many European services companies in the United States export from the U.S. to the rest of the world. So uh, we, we provide each other a base of competitiveness as well. And we're each other's most profitable markets in services. 
But as people will know, the services market is actually quite protected. Now we're talking about real protection. Uh, the EU has not implemented its own directive on services to have an open single market in services. Uh, there's, there's been a second effort to sort of push the, the single market, uh, you know, and implementation is, you know, uneven, let's say it that way. Uh, and I think in Europe often there's a tendency to equate when you hear a word services, you think McDonald's jobs or you think waiters from Poland. Um, but we're talking about, uh, you know, mostly highly paid services. We're talking about financial services, accounting, architectural services, the creative class, these types of things. These are highly paid jobs. Uh, they pay more than manufacturing in, in many cases. Uh, and the same in the United States. But we really have protection here. So if we could open up services, it would have uh, multiple impact on jobs. It would, again, enhance the competitiveness of the two biggest services economies and most competitive in the world. And again, I believe it sent a powerful message to others about opening up their services markets because they're relatively closed elsewhere. So that's another big piece, potentially more important politically than some of the other pieces. Next piece is the non-tariff barriers. This again is uh, potentially huge, but it's also tough. Many of the issues we've had over the last number of years, you'll recall of our fights about bananas and beef and all of that, and the, the last uh, ba battle was about how you clean a chicken. Um, <clears throat> These all sound, you know, they're always the uh, butt of jokes, but for the chicken industry, it's a big deal. Uh, <clears throat> and so how do we uh, deal with this fact that we've become so deeply integrated across the Atlantic, and yet our regulations are somewhat different? They're both, usually, you know, you could say, generalizing, both of our societies have high standards for our people in terms of labor, environment, you know, safety, those types of things. They're different, but they're not really qualitatively, you know, way out of whack with each other. So uh, you could uh, do a lot if somehow we could bring some regulatory coherence to a single market of 800 million people. And there are different ways one will have to think about this. One is, in fact, to tackle the chicken uh, issue. <coughs> and this tough area which links to the agriculture area of the you know, phytosanitary regulations. This is politically obviously a big issue. Uh, and that has been one of the sticking points why we haven't moved this negotiation bef forward before. Um, but it's on the table. Everything's on the table. So now that issue is on the table. We'll see how we do. So some is really getting into this. How do we think about that? Can we change some regulations so they're more in line with both sides? That's one thing, changing regulations. <clears throat> That'll be hard, though. I think going back into the body of law we've accumulated on each side and kind of trying to redo that is going to be hard. I think in some areas we'll probably have to do that. But uh, I don't think that's where the action is, if, if you will. I think where the action is to think forward. It's in areas of uh, innovation, uh, which European American innovators, entrepreneurs, you know, companies are pushing the bounds of human discovery. And it's not that we, the EU has a position, the U.S. has a different position. We don't have a position. Uh, and we don't know what the legislation would be in the future. Say, nanobiotechnology. We know there will probably, because of that changing field, there will probably be some legislation. <clears throat> in the past, uh, the European side has done its legislation, the American done it, and then we smash into each other because we, we did it slightly differently. So if legislators could be part of this process and as they draft legislation in forward areas, have some way of talking to their colleagues and understanding what the process is on the other side and trying to simply preempt uh, silly kinds, sometimes it's silly kinds of uh, problems, uh, we would save lots of money, uh, frankly. And we keep everything open and aligned. So it's, a, it's more of a process. One interesting thing about this uh, uh, negotiation, if you talk to negotiators, they're talking about a living process. They're not talking about a trade agreement. You sign, you're done, you ratify, finished. We're talking about a, a new relationship and where this regulatory piece becomes really quite critical. 
we have a whole process in the United States of our independent regulatory agencies um, that don't believe they actually need to worry about what foreigners think. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, not the same kind of structure on the European side. Um, and so there is going to be some difference in structure that we'll need to deal with. Uh, but I think you can deal with it, but it has to be dealt with. And it really it starts to involve stakeholders and agencies that are traditionally domestically focused and haven't you know, traditionally been part of this relationship. But we'll have to do that. The, the third area on the regulation, which is potentially, uh, I think, quite important, but um, wouldn't mean having to negotiate a change to domestic legislation, is simply to say, in some sectors of the economy, your regulations are essentially equivalent to our regulations. They're not the same, but they're unbalanced, essentially equivalent. And we recognize that if your authorities approve something as safe and healthy and, and you know, good quality, we'll accept it. And whether you could do the same thing if our authorities do that, that would be a, a sort of a declaration of essential equivalence. It would mean you wouldn't have to negotiate sector by sector, every sector. You could find some sectors where we're OK with that. Now, that might seem challenging, but the, actually the one area where we already do that is the area that is usually in the newspapers is where we never agree with each other, and that's Boeing Airbus. It's the airline industry. If Boeing builds an airplane in the United States, and our authorities say it's, it can fly, Europe says fine. It's not tested again. There's not another process here. And if uh, there's an you know, airplane built in Europe, and your authorities say it's flight worthy, we agree to that. Uh, so we already have, in some areas, this process that's already happening. And so part of the challenge here, can we identify a number of areas like that and declare this essential equivalence? It's a little different than mutual recognition agreements, which are negotiated uh, sectoral agreements. We did that uh, in the Clinton administration and at the early Bush administration uh, with the EU. You know, two, three-year negotiations in like marine safety or marine uh, vessels. Uh, it was good for that industry, but it was not, it didn't get any political traction. It took three years on one sector. So you can imagine it would be an impossible sort of overall negotiation to do that. Um, so that would be, uh, on the regulatory side, some areas where you could advance the process. So if you put all of that together, that's an ambitious package. It's far beyond a trade agreement. As I said, trade actually isn't the most dynamic element here, although it would be big itself. But my push would be to say, I don't think business actually is all that interested in any, anything I just said. If it's, there's not an equivalent message and signal to the rest of the world about what this partnership is about, because the higher growth markets are elsewhere. And if, there, if we, ha we have to relate how our partnership now relates to the growth markets globally and how it relates to the multilateral system, critics will charge that a US-EU agreement will subvert the multilateral system, because we're so big, if we strike a deal, what happens to the you know, WTO system? Um, and I've, I've already seen some of this. I think, frankly, it's a lazy argument. I think it's people who haven't actually thought through this through too much. They're sort of just doing uh, you know, tradition, traditional economics and haven't, haven't sort of thought through what we're really talking about here. The Doha round didn't work out. Uh, it could still work out. I think the US and EU would be fine to go back if we had any sense that there was any prospect, but there's no prospect. And yet, the US and the EU did agree on a lot of things in the Doha round, but because we couldn't get 180 countries to agree, we got no agreement. But there are agreements inherent in the Doha package that are just waiting to be moved forward. Uh, trade facilitation, for instance. We basically agreed on that. So why couldn't we, as part of this partnership, just agree on a US-EU package on trade facilitation? and move ahead, make it open. Others could join us. Uh, we've done that before, and it's worked. We've, when we have taken the lead in opening markets together, made it open to others to associate them was, themselves with, we've done that. The International Telecommunications Agreement in the 90s uh, is an example of that. 
uh, is a real free trade agreement. Uh, and it, it was because US EU leadership uh, moved it forward. So this, this partnership has to not just be about the Translate market, but how to use the Translate market to push uh, and extend the multilateral system into new areas. I think we have to square that circle. And we have to be very clear to critics that that's what we mean. This is not building Fortress Atlantica. Uh, even the US-EU agreement would have to be open to be WTO consistent. We would negotiate it, but we have to open it to others. Uh, I'm going later to Norway. I'm sure they're very interested to know what this means for them. <coughs> I'm going to Turkey in a, in a month or so. They're really interested in what this means for them. Um, but so is Mexico, and so is Brazil, and so are many countries around the world. They're, they're looking at this now to see what does it mean. And so I think that's what I'm saying about the real transformative potential of this type of agreement is not that we're going to gang up on others. It's not that we're going to subvert the multilateral system. But we have to use the agreement to strengthen it. And that means also uh, sending strong messages about the rules-based international order and whether we believe in it or not. In recent years, we have not been very consistent. Uh, the US has a certain standard. The EU has a certain standard. We go through one door in Beijing and says, you know, this is kind of the standard. You go through the other door, say, well, our standard's a little better. We keep doing that, we're going to have the Chinese standard. It's kind of a simple choice, I think. Uh, but if we can still together say, such as an investment, for instance, here's the standard we believe in. It's a high standard for our people. It's open economy. It's based on rules. And we're going to act on that together, not only in our transatlantic market, but elsewhere. That sends a powerful message. Many of the rising powers, I think, are having their own debates about whether they accommodate themselves to the international rules-based order or challenge it. And the message we send to them as they're having that debate is really very important. And the message we've been sending in the past years is a, a muddled one. And we haven't shown that our own model, based on those rules, works for our own people. That, I come back to where I began. We have to show. Our model works for our own people first. And then we have to act on that and show that it can work for others too. And using our partnership then to open opportunity for billions of people to enter a strong and open world trading system and economic system uh, would be the best way to use this, uh, this partnership. And there are a number of areas on, on standards, uh, rules, where we simply should say, say together we still believe in these things. Uh, and we're, this will be the core of any standard that we could set globally. We no longer can set the standard ourselves. We're really quite indispensable, but we're insufficient these days together to really set the terms of the global economy. But we can still form the core of any standard. And if we do not do it together, the standard will start to be set by others. And we're going to have to then be, we'll be in reactive and competitive mode on that. Uh, and that won't be in either of our interests. So this, these last pieces, I think, are just as important. When I talk to businesses who haven't been involved in the transatlantic world, uh, this is what excites them the most, not the first part of what I was talking about. They all say, well, that's all running kind of well. You know, we know there are these problems, but, but if you can really reposition the relationship to open the world economic system, then we're with you. And uh, so I, I, it's very interesting. Last point on the politics of this, at least in the United States, uh, because some, uh, I always often get that question. You know, uh, American labor unions and the Democratic Party uh, often have been uh, question free trade agreements uh, traditionally because of concerns about labor, you know, environment, health standards, safety standards. They love the idea of doing it with Europe. Uh, the Democratic politics has completely changed when we talk about an agreement with Europe. The, the AFL-CIO, the other labor unions, they're on record as favoring this agreement already. So uh, because your standards are better than ours in some areas, and they're hoping actually to bring some European models into the United States. And now then the businesses get nervous. But uh, I just want to leave on that point because the politics of the economic agreement with Europe is very different, uh, at least in our country, than the other ones that we've had in recent years.
uh, and I think that ar argues well for this. It means at the moment I see no organized opposition to the notion of a USEU agreement. Once the details get clearer, of course, certain special interests will be affected. But there's also no organized support. And I would argue also here, there's no organized really support. So if this negotiation is going to really make a difference and we're going to get it ratified, uh, there, there needs to be a new set, sort of a second track now underway. Think tanks, st stakeholders, to start to explain the potential of this agreement and to start to build that type of support for it uh, once you know, we get a little further down the road. So thank you.